Okay, that's the John Schofield podcast I have been listening to with Corey Wong and the Wong notes. <laughs> I only know the wrong notes, but anyways, um, that's a great episode. You have to check it out definitely. And by the way, I'm playing a concert. So if you're living in Berlin, you can come to the Re. Today it's a Q&A question session. I got a lot of questions. Thank you so much. I'm going to try to answer them all. I really love to answer questions. First question is from Neil Gardner. I like your sense of phrasing. Thank you. <laughs> so maybe some tips on how to break the habit of running scales and Apache patterns. Yes. I think what really helped me a lot was transcribing solos or more or less like playing along with solos and just really trying to play together with that person, be it Kurt Rosenwinkel, Peter Bernstein or Jimmy Rainey or Jim Hall and just like really trying to play with that person. Sometimes that can be tough because hard stuff that they're playing. There's also the train of thought of singing along the phrase. So listening really a lot to jazz and then singing along. I think this is the most common advice. Another thing that is maybe a great idea and that I try to do with my students is improvise so like you would normally in improvise but this time it's going to be an exercise. You're going to tell yourself that you're going to practice not playing the stuff that you normally play. So it's more or less forbidden to play a phrase or a thing that you would be playing like always so you're going to improvise and when you when you feel you are at that point you stop you make make a conscious decision to stop and try to play something else or maybe even take that thing that you have been playing forever and rephrase it and play it in a different way i think it's also very good to be aware of the subdivisions so if you're not sure what you're doing you could be playing to a jam track or on your own consecutive eight notes only triplets only 60 notes only quintuplets whatever you are into but you're going to play this subdivision for a long time without an interruption so that you get a really good feeling for this subdivision and then you can also switch between the different subdivisions it can also help with phrasing because it forces you also to not play the thing that you would normally play because you have to keep on going. One last thing to the subject of phrasing is think about where your note ends. I have the feeling horn players talk about that all the time but if you're playing a phrase and this is your last phrase so try to end it in a place that you sort of choose so if it would be one and two and three and four and one. So I chose to end it on the one. I could end it on the four and one and two and three and four and. You know what I mean? So not only thinking about where the phrase starts but where it ends and also yes, last but not least, listen to your own improvisations, record yourself and listen and try to understand where you start in the bar. Maybe you're starting very often on the two or on the two and then take that phrase, the same phrase and start it on another beat and that's already going to be very cool. Joe Evito asks work on triads. Yes, I have to say, I have some notes here. I really never worked a lot on triads. So if you want to work on triads that are more like, you know, triad pairs like Kurt Rosenwinkel stuff, I think this book is a really good help. Never practiced it. More talking like chords and stuff. You could check out Georg von Epps. This is volume one, there are three volumes, I don't know. But I think it's very good, never worked with it. Has a lot of voice leading ideas and yes, you can do so much with triads. And ah, one thing maybe that would be helpful is learning the closed position triads and the open position triads. So for example, the uh, closed triads, F major, augmented, F minor, half diminished, and just learning those chords on different string pairs and also shifting them through a scale like F major, G minor. So you get the idea. And then the open triads, F major, F augmented. 
so beautiful. F minor, half diminished. And then also thinking about shifting them, for example, through the F major scale. So Martin Addis asks, how do you master the guitar? Been trying for 55 years, still get, can't get there. <laughs> Is there any hope for me? And so I don't know if I'm the right person to answer that question. I've been thinking about that question. I don't know, it's probably half fun, half serious, I guess. <laughs> But I've been thinking about what does it mean to master the guitar. I don't know if I want to master the guitar because it sounds for me like I would could control the guitar, that's what I associate. They are for sure masters of the guitar, but I also sometimes don't like it so much to think of masters like, you know, it's it's so absolute, it's so no room for the gray, no, gray tones. <laughs> so like, you know, either you're a master or you're nothing. So that is a little bit extreme, but you know, of course, that I totally understand or totally admire many guitar players and musicians and know that they are sort of masters of their instrument. Just want to say, don't be intimidated by an idea of being a master. If you would be a master, I don't know if that would be great. <laughs> I, I, I just don't know if that's important. I think what's important to have a process of practicing and playing and being curious and evolving and trying new things and also learning and also being self-critical and really always trying to feel how how is it going with the guitar and being honest to yourself but it's really like a relationship with the guitar and with the music i think and i for myself i really rather try to focus on the process on getting up each day and playing the guitar each day and then at least <laughs> I feel I master myself and then I'm happy. Uh, dear Tina, it would be interesting if you could make a video on the subject of outside improvisation. Yeah. Outside improvisation. I just have been listening to the podcast with John Schofield and John Schofield actually is talking about outside improvisation, the podcast. So maybe you want to check that out. I think, I don't know if I'm playing a lot of outside stuff. I always associate playing outside with playing more on a, like one chord, more like in a modal situation. I think it all comes down to tension and release. So if you would be playing a blues, I think if you start by playing something which is really home, very clear, a very clear tonic sound, like in a F blues, for example, and you just work on playing that sound in the spaces where there is the tonic, then you can practically play whatever you want in the other places. That's what I try to do. One thing that is maybe a little bit more hands-on. What I like to do is play a tritone substitution, arpeggio over a dominant seventh chord. So, so for example, in bar four, you have the F7, right? And then the tritone substitute, the B7. And I really like to play that B natural seven arpeggio. Over this F7. Especially in this place because it resolves really nicely to the B flat 7 in the fifth bar. And instead of playing the C7, 
playing the G flat 7 arpeggio. So the next question is ways to memorize a chord progression. I think that's a very good question. Yes, how can you memorize a chord progression? <laughs> I think we all experience that every once in a while. We go on a session or we play with friends, somebody, and then they call a tune that you actually know and then you realize you don't know the chords anymore and that can be kind of frustrating. And I think Memorizing tunes or also transcription is really like a muscle that you can build and I have been memorizing quite a lot of transcriptions and also quite a lot of tunes and I wouldn't say exactly that it gets a lot easier but it's get it's for me it became a habit and I rather play by heart than with the sheet music in front of me because I always know that it will have a, an effect of the music if I'm reading at the same time. So I think patience, right? Patience, be patient. And then just start with one tune that you want to learn and then just learn the first four bars. I would really work with chunks. So learn the first four bars and the next day you learn the next four bars and you continue like this and if you have the feeling that you're not sure about what you have learned so far you start over again but I think it's very important that when you sit down the next day that you really absolutely forbid yourself to look at the sheet at all costs so you would always first take your guitar into hand especially if you're going to play a song or want to learn a song that you used to know i'm so guilty of that as well but i try if i can not to look don't look in the internet don't look anywhere get your guitar and try to maybe play the melody play some of the chords you know and try to get back as much into your memory as you had before and then Things will come to you. You have to trust that uh, process. So if you're a beginner, I would start by memorizing the chord shapes. Really, that's all absolutely okay. Like, you know, A minor seven. So let's say the first four chords would be A minor seven, D seven, G major. So the first step would be to memorize those shapes and you memorize them by playing them over and over again let's say for 10 minutes each day and the next day try to do the same thing and maybe if you can you say a minor seven while you're playing d7 you say the name of the of the chords and if that's getting easy then you can think okay a minor seven do i know another chord voicing Right, there's another one here. So, D7. Do I know another chord voicing? Yes. G7. You know what I mean? So you start by really learning the chord shapes, but then you're trying to leave the chord shapes and really learn the chords or the chord progression and try to think about A minus 7, but then it doesn't mean anymore it has to be that shape can be another shape as well a lot of shapes <laughs> and last but not least so I would try to transpose this progression because transposing magically burns it deeper into the brain don't ask me why so I'm oh, sorry and then say the name of the chord D minus 7 Right? Do the same thing maybe with other chords. In this way you're looking at it from different perspectives that helps a lot. And if you if you recognize chord progressions like this, oh this is a 2, 5, 1, 6. That's even better because then you can sort of catalog it in your brain in another way. So it's a 2, 5, 1, 6. And then you will realize over time that there are many chord progressions that repeat themselves. But it's not only the 251, there are other chord progressions as well, but you will find them after a while. And then it's going to get easier with the, with the remembering of the tunes because it's like old friends, right? You know, oh, you're the four minor everybody's talking about so much. <laughs> 
So the next question is actually my favorite question. It comes from Ramon. Hi, Ramon. And um, yes, I, I just read it out loud. I'd be extremely interested in details about your journey to making an album, motivation, inspiration, challenges, ups and downs. Also, own compositions, how, why or why not. So, could actually talk about that for hours, <laughs> as some of you might know. I don't know where to start. Let's start like this. I used to have that big fantasy, right? So I'm going to record an album. It's going to be fantastic, right? So it's going to be recorded in a great studio with the best studio engineers, with the best musicians, with the greatest songs that I have been written. It's, we don't have to talk about that. <laughs> I'm going to play a guitar solo or guitar playing that is otherworldly. The layout, the graphics going to be great and it's going to change my life because <laughs> it's going to be so great. It's going to be, everybody's going to be talking about, I'm going to play concerts, I'm going to play on festivals, I'm going to tour the world. So it's not a lot of expectations, right? So this is what happens happened for me for, for many years. <laughs> it still does happen sometimes. Well, actually, I don't know. And... The flip side of this fantasy is total depression. I can't play at all. Um, I'm recording something. I want to <laughs> not destroy it, but I don't want to publish it. It totally sucks. I can't understand how anybody wants to listen to it. So I think one thing that really helped me is the YouTube channel because I'm publishing a lot of stuff. And since I'm publishing a lot of stuff, my perfectionism on each and every video is maybe not as high as it would be if I would only publish a video once a year, if you know what I mean. So it's really perfectionism which haunts me totally and it leads to the fact that I don't get shit done. I don't have a lot of records. I recorded one 10 years ago. I, re I recorded a solo guitar album actually three weeks ago, you know, like I forgot. I'm going to publish that and I really have to remind myself to, that that's an accomplishment, that I did that and that's great. That was my goal for this year and I'm like, yeah, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I don't know what that is. So anyways, I want to say I'm working on the next record, which is going to be a tribute to John Schofield. And I'm just trying to sort of outsmart myself um, by, the, by completely following my heart. So in the pandemic, I have been on the playground forever because the kindergarten was closed. And I think after some months, I started listening to the John Schofield record, Agogo, on the playground between the children and the... I don't know the name in English, like the Schaukel und the Rutsche. <laughs> and I listened to him and it was really gave me back so much confidence and it reminded me of who I am. And also it just like filled my heart with so much joy. And also John Schofield was one of the first guitar players I really listened to a lot. I listened to a lot of the, his fusion stuff. I did, didn't understand a word, and, but I, I really loved it so much. That's how I chose the next, how I chose the repertoire for the next album, because I think I really connect to it. Of course, there's this other side, like I, I, I'm going to play John Schofield, really fusion. My, I mean, it doesn't have to be fusion, right? The compositions don't have to be played in a certain way. I can take my liberties. But of course, there's always this, what are other people are going to think about it. But on the other hand, trying to give not a shit. So, and I really love John Schofield and his playing and that's not fake. And it, that's a value for me. And that's how I choose my repertoire. And also I know if I would now plan to make an album with only my own songs that I would ask too much of myself and that it wouldn't happen. So I'm trying to lead myself with baby steps, right? You know, like a little bit like making educational videos and YouTube has been easy for me because I'm teaching so much. Then a solo guitar album, that's only me I have to handle. Now a trio record, you know, that's three persons. So, and also not, yes, just like reduce expectations, if that makes any sense, yeah. 
what always happens. So now I'm already working on the John Schofield album. I'm just playing the songs and trying to get them into my ears. And then I know if I'm digesting them, if I let them marinate, I will come up with my own stuff, sort of. And But already it's work, of course. And already I ha I'm fantasizing about the next thing. But that's what always happens also with the YouTube videos. While I'm making one, I'm fantasizing about the next project. But yes, I really just want to, just want to get sh shit done. That's, that's my goal. That was a very long answer, I'm sorry. Did you study music at school and how was your experience? Yes, I actually studied music. I studied in Würzburg, that's a, t a city in Germany. And then I studied in Amsterdam for four years and I also studied for a short period of time in Paris. I would absolutely recommend to study guitar or music if you can. There are pros and cons, of course, but I think for me personally, I learned a lot. And here in Germany, for example, if you have a degree, it really helps with teaching at private or public schools because you're actually getting paid more money per hour. So it definitely makes uh, a difference. And you're going to get to know a lot of people. You're going to live in, in a bubble with a lot of other guitar players or other musicians and you're going to get in contact with great musicians who maybe do clinics there. So overall that's a really good experience. I of course hated it. <laughs> I mean I don't hate, I didn't hate it. I loved and hated it. So I loved the fact that my parents paid for my studies. I have to thank them for that. I lived in Amsterdam in the middle of the city in a small apartment and I had a bike and I could bike to the school and I could like rehearse there. I could use the studio and I really loved this time where I could practice so much and could focus so much on the guitar. On the other hand, sometimes I wish it would have been more like a teaching style with like, you know, concepts, you know, like if you're weak at rhythm or if you don't hear anything or that you would get a concept. And that is what I'm always trying to give people or students that come to me a concept that helps them with, that they can work with it to improve their weaknesses. For me, we have been playing standards, you know, every week one standard. I had to prepare one standard every week by heart. Okay, that's great. And then we would be playing the standard. Then I would listen to the advice of my teacher that was most of the time the right chord changes. And if I did play the right notes over the right chord, so if I could play the changes. And um, also playing longer eight notes was emphasized a lot. And I found that not a very creative approach and rebellious as I am, I sometimes really threw a tantrum, not in public, but at home. So I remember I got a, a like grade for, a, for, a, for an exam and I, I got so angry. I actually, um, I ripped the paper apart. I don't know why I'm <laughs> telling that now, but yes, that I always felt like everybody has to fulfill the same tasks and everybody, you know, let's put it another way. If you would be able to play rhythm changes on 140 half notes, fluent eight notes, then you would probably get a 10. So that would be the highest note. And I, fi I find that a little bit stupid. <laughs> On the other hand, I have to say, yes, I got a solid foundation and I'm very happy I have that now. It worked out well for me, but sometimes I still try to get rid of too many things in my head that are telling me about wrong and right. And it's tricky, you know, because there are things that don't sound good, of course. <laughs> yes. Hi, my question is how can I regain my chops after a couple of months of not playing at all? So I always, I'm always wondering, so we all know we can't lose some of our abilities. We can never lose them, right? So like if you're learning a language, you will be always able to get back in that language. Also, it may take some days or weeks, but it's not it's never for nothing. So I'm always wondering, right, what will always be there? But then there are also those like fine motorical skills, like playing fast, having a good timing, especially that you can only have when you're playing 
every day and practicing every day and I can really feel that if I'm practicing every day so I haven't been practicing for two weeks because everybody was ill <laughs> me included so then I can really feel like that the synchronization and all yes the touch I'm losing the touch and the, I'm getting that only back if, if I'm starting practicing again so if you're not have been playing for many months I think that's my personal experience the longer I'm not playing the harder it can be to start playing again and then when you have your guitar back in hand it's like why why didn't I play I don't know I would start by playing 10 minutes every day and if you want to play longer you can play longer but you have to play 10 minutes at least and maybe you can give yourself a challenge i really like challenges so maybe you can give yourself a challenge like i'm going to play 10 minutes every day for the next 30 days that's what i would do and what do you want to practice start with what you have been practicing start with what you have been practicing and then go and decide what you want to practice when you have been playing again. You know what I mean? Just not thinking and fantasizing. <laughs> not that you would do that, but I'm doing that all the time. What you're going to practice and how great you're going to sound, but just like get the guitar for fuck's sake, get the guitar in your hand and play something for 10 minutes, whatever it is. And then you develop a practice plan from there and ideas will come, I'm sure. I'm learning economy picking to improve my speed. Could you do something on this, including jazz exercise? Yes, so uh, that's a very good idea to work on economy picking. Congratulations. And yes, so there's one book, Don't Be Shocked, Where Is It, that I really like. It's this book, he's a metal guy, but he's really the only one who ever really has sort of a system for learning economy picking and what I really like is that he's actually starting with playing on one string for a really long time and then playing on two strings so he has kind of a concept and he's really starting with a tremolo exercise and I think playing tremolo exercise is a really good thing just playing a scale like this So alternate picking and then playing the same thing and that's an exercise that I really like in the same speed only with downstrokes. And then playing it only with upstrokes. So that's one thing that I would suggest and then if it has to be chess you just take an arpeggio, take the A7 arpeggio. So. And then this is another tremolo exercise that I learned a long time ago. It's Ali Miola tremolo exercise. So you're just playing six notes per note and just play that through the arpeggio. One last thing that I want to say is what helps me a lot. You know, pianists, they pian, pianists, 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 pianist, 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 pianist. So pianist, pianist, you know, they practice their right and their left hand separately. We can do that too. So, and that helps so much because I think the brain processes the processes differently so if you're playing a phrase whatever it is let's say um so then you learn by heart the right hand without the left hand so down up down up just let's say the first four notes down up down up and then you play down up down up down up you practice it like this exaggerated completely like the classically trained uh, musicians do if they have a hard spot they make it even harder you know like if they have to jump from here to there they will practice jumping from here to there <laughs> so if you're playing the phrase in this tempo 
trying to play it faster. So um, yes, the last thing that I want to mention regarding economy picking is, and that's from Troy Statina as well, that's very interesting, is he says you're going to learn a certain technique starting with 16th notes at 140 beats per minute. <laughs> Try to do that and then get back to your normal speed and feel how it's different. So that's what I would suggest. First of all, you can always improve, right? And I've been watching my own videos four years ago and I was really astonished how bad my left hand sometimes looked, very stiff. And there is a lot of change going on. And yes, you can always improve. And there are also a lot of different things that you can do. I think it's very important to reflect on the way you're practicing or you're playing music. So if you are having the feeling you're not improving, maybe trying something new. So if you have been visiting a teacher for 10 years, maybe try another teacher. Not because the teacher is not good, but because everybody has another perspective. If you maybe never had a teacher, I would say go and get a teacher for a year or two at least. And if you always have been reading music, I would say don't read music. If you never read music, maybe you read music. Have a look at yourself and your practice routine and be very analytical and try to switch things up, try to change things up sometimes. For me, for example, for a long time, certain things were like forbidden. Don't ask me why that would be like this, but I would not, never would have make I think about making a John Scofield record, for example, but now I'm thinking maybe that's really good because I've been practicing chess standards like forever and I'm feeling like exhausted by them. So I have to go somewhere else and maybe come back later so that there's some fresh air in my playing. If you don't know, for example, how where you could improve anymore, meet with anybody, another guitar player, another horn player and just play together. And then I'm sure you can make a list afterwards what you can work on. <laughs> How to reduce left hand tension and avoid injury. Okay, there's one um, exercise that I like a lot. I'm going to show you. So you take a note and play it. And then you release the pressure until you know the note is gone. And then you press again. find the sweet spot where does the note really come and it doesn't need a lot of pressure so it's press, pressure and looseness going back and forth until you find that note that space that spot and then you can play something like the legato exercise and then you could start your practice routine like this because then you're making sure you feel that you don't need so much pressure at the beginning of the session of your practice session five minutes and yet then you forget about it of course if you're experiencing pain while playing i would always say stop i would also always say stop for one or two days and come back don't play with pain don't play through pain so and just play this exercise and and trust in it it will change your playing completely and you don't have to drive yourself crazy that you will play everything like this then but you play this exercise in the beginning and you're really conscious about the pressure in your left hand uh, for five minutes and then you go on and practice like you used to practice another thing that i want to say is that you realize the harder you pick, the harder you push on the right hand, the more you have to press down on the string. So it's good to find a kind of an equilibrium there. So just check that out. I like it to, I don't like to play too soft with my right hand. I like to have a little bit of a punch. And last but not least, try to build some strengths. And one way of building strengths, but you have to be careful, um, it's really bar chords, right? Playing a bar chord. And yes, just play some chords, invent some exercises with your right hand. And if you will never play bar chords in jazz, it doesn't matter. 
or not very often. That spills a lot of strength. Just check it out and it will make everything else easier. Because you know, if you're thinking of a bodybuilder, if you have to lift like, so if I would have to lift like 50 kilos, I don't know, I would po probably break my, my back. But I, if I would like, you know, start with five kilos every day and blah, blah, blah. Think about, <laughs> it's a little bit the same thing with the hand. A lot of guitar players have really strong hands, but then they play very soft and easy. I want to learn fingerboard to play jazz guitar because I'm knocking the door of jazz, but I can't come into the room of jazz. Yes, so the fingerboard and playing jazz, it's not the same thing. You don't have to know your fingerboard for playing jazz. I think um, learning to play notes, for example, on the fretboard is a great exercise. If you would do that for 10 minutes, maybe with that Berkeley series, practicing side reading, be patient, and then you will know the notes after a while. I think if you're having the feeling you can't get into the door, I don't know if you mean with playing or with listening, but listening wise, I would really, really advise you to go to a concert because for me, jazz music is really live music. And there's some records I wouldn't listen to at home, but I would listen joyfully a whole evening on stage. It's, I think it's the energy in the room and get yourself infected with that energy. Yes. I would really suggest to go out and listen to music, to a lot of music and maybe buy, if you like the record, buy the CD afterwards that really helps to take the atmosphere with you and then maybe get a good teacher and be patient, be patient. It's a little bit like, you know, tasting a strange fruit or drinking some wine that you don't like at the first moment, but then after a while it's so endlessly endlessly nice <laughs> how can i make my tone clearer and warmer just using the amp and a compressor pedal i use it to create a slightly artificial sustain how can i make my tone clearer and warmer using an amp and a compressor pedal so i would suggest not to use anything at all but your guitar and maybe practice in the bathroom and just really listen to the sound that you get out of your guitar like this and try to get a really warm and clear tone like this. A lot of the things that I have been talking about today, like playing legato, not having too much pressure, having really small movement in the right hand, all those things can lead to having an, a really nice and warm tone. You can also experiment with the angle of the pick. So you can also experiment with the angle that you're playing. So you could play like very parallel. But you can also skip it a little bit. So using more of the side of the pick. And yes, also, yes, really watch out for the sides of your pick if they're really even. I'm really thinking that different plastics uh, sound different. Yes, I would start, I would really start with the electric guitar as an acoustic instrument and then just put in your amp and then put any pedal that you're using as the last thing that you're using but I wouldn't work on my tone like this you know because for me the tone comes from the hands and that's the foundation and the rest is the topping so to speak the cherry on top but that's only my opinion <laughs> not sure if you talked about your guitar before but my question is what pickups are in your guitar maybe talk about your guitar and amp yes yeah, so I have been talking actually about this guitar there is a video and I've completely forgot the pickups because I'm not so much into the technical stuff but if you watch that video or if you look at the comments a lot of people wrote a lot of stuff about this guitar <laughs> and I'm sure you'll be happy there and yes so I'm, I'm using this amp here it's an Henriksen amp and I heard it's not existing like this anymore unfortunately yes and I, I really like this amp it's very solid and I basically just plug my guitar into the amp and that's it I sometimes use a volume pedal I sometimes sometimes use an octaver but that's a long time ago but that's basically what I do so thank you for watching my videos thank you for hanging out with me it was a lot of fun talking about all those different subjects and I see you in the next video bye
And I have people ask me all the time too about like, oh, should I learn music theory? It's like, well, that's a tough question because I think you really should learn music theory just so you have the language in common. Like, hey, go to the minor four chord. So, so, so if somebody says that to you, you know what they're talking about, you know, just for a, a means of communication. But as far as like writing or playing, I think you're right. Like I, I, I'm starting to learn the same thing that instinct is so much of of the game and it's such a huge part and, and i guess we can improve what we know like when you first play a four minor chord you might not really hear it but if mm -hmm. you play it enough and and understand it intellectually after a while it becomes instinct that's what i've i've found for me because i don't have perfect pitch i'm no genius musical genius you know i'm a genius not a music no um <laughs>